Welcome to an introduction to economics brought to you by Park Bench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. In this podcast, we shall take a first look at resource allocation. The wants of society usually exceed the available resources of labor and capital, so there needs to be decisions taken about the allocation of these resources. There are different ways of taking these decisions, and the allocation is a part of general equilibrium analysis, which considers allocation of resources in production and the distribution of what is produced. General equilibrium means equilibrium in the market for all commodities and resources at the same time. At this point, there should be no forces that cause a change in behavior. So, in this situation, how are decisions made about allocation? What are the ways in which we can allocate resources? What are the advantages and disadvantages of the different ways? And how would we do this in an open economy? Previously, we talked of equilibrium which was partial. It did not relate to the whole economic system. General equilibrium relates to the whole economic system. Let us return to consider the production of two goods. We'll have our old friends cloth and food. The point OA is where all resources are used to produce the maximum amount of food, and OB, the point where we produce the maximum amount of cloth. The curve AB is the production possibility frontier. The slope of AB represents the rate we can turn production of food to cloth, the marginal rate of transformation. All the production possibilities are along the line AB. Which of the many combinations of food and cloth will be chosen? C1C1 and C1C2 are community indifference curves, which show a community's preference. C1C1 is the highest of these curves that can be reached, and it meets the curve AB at point Z. The highest attainable community indifference curve is at a tangent to AB at point Z. At this point we have F1 tons of food being produced and C1 meters of cloth. We cannot increase either of these quantities without reducing the output of the other one. A community indifference curve joins all the points of all the different combinations of two goods which yield the same utility to a community. To recap here, we are looking for the desired combination of production of food and cloth. This is the combination that maximizes social welfare. We look at where the highest community indifference curve meets the line for production possibility frontier. This is at point Z, which is at a tangent to the production possibility frontier. Z represents a point for economic efficiency and equity. Let us return to the three basic questions for economics. What do we produce? How do we produce? And for whom do we produce? Deciding what we should produce will depend on the scarcity of resources, the choices of the community, and opportunity costs. In the example we chose, it was a choice between food production and cloth production. How the goods are produced may vary from one country to another. In some of the Asian economies, the cost of labor is very cheap, and the choice might be between a plentiful supply of cheap labor and the scarcity of capital for machinery. Many clothes are made with labor-intensive units. In the UK or the USA, the cost of labor is expensive, and usually the cost of capital is comparatively cheap. The output mix of an Asian country and the USA will be different for this reason. Who we produce for is a part of normative economics. It brings into play attitudes of fairness and equality. The aim is to maximize social welfare. Point Z that we found will only maximize social welfare 
if the giving distribution at that point on the community indifference curve was the socially desirable one. In a closed community, which means that we are choosing to ignore the effects of international trade, there are three main choices. These are a pure market economy, a mixed economy and a command economy. In a pure market economy it is the forces of demand and supply that will determine prices and output levels. There is no external body involved in the setting of prices or setting targets for production. How a good is produced is determined by competition. A firm seeking to maximize profit will try and adopt the most cost efficient methods, whether these are labor intensive or technology intensive. For whom is also determined by demand and supply. Actually the situation is not that perfect since for whom it is produced depends on the purchasing power of the consumer and not all consumers have equal purchasing power. Here we see our old friends the demand and supply curves. These are shown for two goods, X and Y, which we are going to assume as substitutes for each other. X is produced by labour intensive means and Y by capital intensive means. If consumers develop a preference for X, then demand for X rises and demand for Y falls. For X, DDX shifts to D dash DX dash. For Y, it falls from D DY to D dash DY dash. Look at the effect on price in the short run. The price of good X rises from PX to PX dash and the price of good Y falls from PY to PY dash. More of X is supplied, the quantity rises from QX to QX dash. Less of Y is supplied so the quantity falls. Now let us consider what might happen next. If the production of X is more profitable, then firms may shift from producing Y to producing X. This will then shift the supply curves for both X and Y. It may look a little complicated, but just focus on the supply curves, the red lines. For X, the shift is to the right. For Y, the shift is to the left. So in this case X was the labour intensive good and Y was the capital intensive good. The increased demand for X caused a shift of labour to X. More labour was needed than was released by Y. This lets wages rise to recruit the extra labour. There is a shift of capital from Y and thus a downward pressure on the price of capital. Now let us consider a mixed economy. How does this differ from the pure market economy we have just considered? There is a cost to obtaining information, which means that information is not always available in the market. Many sellers, such as shop assistants in many cases, are simply not competent to talk of technical merits of electronic goods or of automobiles. Consumers are unlikely to have knowledge of the complete range of goods they seek. Workers may not even be aware of wage rates outside of their own locality. The emergence of monopolies allows some firms to control prices. Some goods, such as water, are supplied by monopolies we call natural monopolies. It was thought that electricity and gas fell into this group, but the UK has been successful in introducing competition here. A group with a monopoly can set prices to maximise profits the price set may be above a competitive level. Price mechanisms do not reflect social costs such as pollution. The price mechanism is not considered suitable where goods are consumed in what we can refer to as lumps. This includes the police and fire services. These are considered as public goods and services. In a command economy, a central planning group would have determined production and distribution. Factories are directed so they will be told what to produce, where to obtain the necessary resources, which technology to use for production, 
and where the finished product will go. There are no really pure e command economies. Perhaps North Korea comes close. Socialist countries do tend towards command economies and many former Soviet satellites were close to a command economy. If there were a pure command economy, would we need money? There would be no need for prices. Ration cards would simply tell a consumer what could be obtained and from where. This ends the first of our podcasts on resource allocation, brought to you by Park Bench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. Thank you for watching and for listening. We wish you every success in your studies. For further information about Parkbench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com.